Yo, what's going on E7 fam, as well as Overlord fans. I'm Sue, but feel free to call me Pat, and this is my first thoughts and initial impressions for the Overlord himself, Einzul Gon. He is the free 5-star that you'll be getting for logging in during the Overlord collab, so everyone will have access to him. In this video, I'll be breaking down how good I think Einz is not only for Epic 7 veterans, but new players to the game who are coming here from the Overlord collab. I'll go over his skills, how I play the character, and where I think he's best used. This will be the first of three videos with my impressions of Albedo and Shaltier being linked in this video's description if you want to see those. If you're new here, please consider subscribing and leaving a like on the video. It does help me out here a ton. I'm really close to hitting 10,000 subscribers, so I would appreciate it. And without further ado, let's watch Ayn's ultimate animation. <laughs> Alright, I think they've just nailed the look of this character in this game, and he sounds absolutely amazing as well, and I'd expect no less from his Japanese voiceover artist, Satoshi Hino, who you can hear as Sai in Naruto, Rengoku in Demon Slayer, and Dr. Maruki from Persona 5 Royal, just to name a few. Moving on to Ainz's stats, he has a 5-star Dark Mage of the Taurus Zodiac symbol. 5-star Dark Heroes are generally very rare in Epic 7, so to get one for free during the collab is pretty unprecedented in my opinion. And again, his Zodiac symbol is Taurus. Your combination of class and Zodiac symbol decides your starting stats in Epic 7. So in this case, him being a 5-star Mage of the Taurus Zodiac symbol means that he has the exact same stats as a character like Arya. His actual stat line is overall kind of good. He has low attack and health compared to other 5 stars in Epic 7, which is not what you'd want to see from the Overlord, but he does make up for it by having above average speed at 115 and starting effectiveness to help him land his spells as well as effect resistance, which can be good if you decide to lean into his free artifact, which is the Staff of Einzel Goon that we'll be talking about at the end of this video. Overall, not the best stat line, but it is certainly far from the worst stat line in the game. His imprints, which you will get for free for just playing the collab, are effect resistance for the team or effectiveness for himself. The effect resistance for the team is good in a pinch, but for the most part, you're going to be using him on the self imprint of 27% effectiveness in order to help maximize the chances of landing his skills. Speaking of which, let's break down the character's kit before we talk about how I'd build him and where I'd play him. And of course, we'll start with the ultimate ability, the goal of all life is death. Acquire two souls upon use, and this move has a 3-4 to four turn cooldown depending on skill level. This move is a single target attack that dispels all buffs from the enemy before silencing them for one turn, and has a 70-100% to 100 chance based on skill level to inflict death sentence. This skill is unaffected by cooldown increase and decrease effects. Death Sentence is a unique, undispellable debuff that only Ainz has. It states, at the start of someone's 12th turn, deals 50,000 fixed damage to the bearer, ignores damage sharing effects, dispelled when the caster dies. So let's break down Death Sentence for those of you who are new. At the start of someone's 12th turn, this move deals 50,000 true damage to the original target of the goal of all life is death. That is almost assuredly a kill in most player versus player situations. This move is not particularly very good though in PvE, basically story or adventure content. Ignoring damage sharing effects means tanks can't really save you from this move. And of course, the only way to remove Death Sentence is to kill Ainz himself. Moving on to his passive, it is Overlord of Death. It increases damage suffered from light elemental enemies by 30%. This is a fun nod to the lore. Ainz himself is weak to light-based magic and attacks. When an ally is attacked, there is a 25 to 35% chance for Ainz to activate Mana Barrier based on this skill's level. Mana Barrier can only be activated once every three turns. Mana Barrier is a non-attack skill that grants a barrier to all allies, including Ainz himself, for two turns, and then Ainz adopts a counter-attacking stance for two turns. 
That basically means any time that Ainz is attacked, he has a 100% chance to counter with his basic attack, which we'll talk about next. The barrier strength increases proportional to Ainz's max health. And finally, we have the basic skill for Ainz, which is Lightning of Judgment. It is an AoE attack that has a 25% chance to stun an enemy for one turn. This is obviously very good with the counter-attacking stance from Overlord of Death, and it has a Soul Burn effect stapled to it. Essentially, you could spend 20 souls if you have them in order to use Lightning of Judgment and then get an extra turn after that. It is obviously very good because it gives you another chance at a stun, but also ramps up the turn counter for the goal of all life is death. So now that we know the kit, let's talk about how to play the character. Ainz is very clearly trying to stall out the game in order to pick up kills with his death sentence debuff. The fact that his ultimate has a silence, the fact that he gives his team barriers, and the fact that his basic attack is an AoE stun are pretty much proof. It's all the proof I think I really need to kind of justify that playstyle. He's definitely someone who excels in these long, drawn-out fights, such as a character like Dark Corvus or Twisted Eidolon Kairon might do. And traditionally, those characters do pretty well for new players in PvP game modes like Arena or Guild Wars. And if you look at the current state of PvP, there are some situations where Ainz might be a bit better than those. Injury is pretty common with Urban Shadow Shu, which makes it hard to use Dark Corvus in a lot of situations. And k -Rod, well, his turns aren't very impactful, so if you ignore him, he doesn't really do a whole hell of a lot until it's time for him to pick up the kills with his ultimate. Ainz doesn't really have either of those issues, in my opinion, because, well, his turns can be impactful with AoE stuns. So I think even for veteran players, this character actually holds some pretty decent value, especially if you're an arena grinder or somebody that likes to play Guild Wars. But when it comes to RTA, aka World Arena, against another human player, I think Ainz will struggle here. Overlord of Death is both a blessing and a curse for this character. 100% counter chance is pretty good, very reminiscent of a character like Arya, who he shares a stat line with. But the other stuff, ooh, it's kind of rough. The 30% extra damage that this character takes from light units when you couple the fact that he's a 5300 base HP unit means that a lot of things could probably kill him in one hit. Take, for example, Savior Adam. This is a free-to-play character that's top tier that everyone has access to at high levels of PvP. Yeah, not very good. On top of that, Mana Barrier gives a counterattack stance which... Sounds pretty great on paper until you remember that players at high ranks have characters like Lionheart Sermia, who's somebody who preys on counterattacking based heroes, and Last Rider Crow, which is a tank that dishes out huge damage against AoE based heroes. So you have a character that has a 100% chance to counter. They can just feed their passives and just dish out a ton of damage because, well, you can't turn it off. Oh, and also, by the way, both of those characters. They're light heroes, so uh, kind of rough. On top of that, the goal of all life is death is something that has, I think, a pretty massive flaw that I think the developers should really look into hot fixing before this collab is over. Death Sentence is a debuff. Debuffs innately have a 15% chance of failing in Epic 7. Now imagine that you are in the finals of an Epic 7 tournament and you decide to bet it all on this powerful magic caster. And then his ultimate doesn't really do anything and just goes on cooldown because, well, the game decided, well, you got 15 percented, tough luck. So, I know that sounds all pretty rough, like I've just doomed Ainz to being an unplayable character, but I still think, even at the highest levels of play, he can find success in World Arena. It's just going to be in similar situations that you'd play a character like Dark Corvus as a last pick. If the enemy team doesn't consist of light units and is trying to play a slower, grindy game, well then you can deploy Ainz, inflict Death Sentence on a key unit, and then just sit back with Mana Barrier and Lightning of Judgment counters to stall out and control an entire game for a free win. So yeah, even again, at high level play, I do think this character has some value, which is great because, well, he's a free character. Usually free characters are nowhere near as good as Ainz is. 
As for how I'd play the character, well, there's two build paths that I can foresee you taking with him. First is going to be a fast build that's going to be on a speed set in order to increase the number of chances at stunning with Lightning of Judgment or just getting a key silence with the goal of all life is death. The second build is going to be a bit slower and focuses on getting his health and defense as high as possible in order to survive long enough to proc multiple instances of death sentence. Protection set, I think, would probably be a pretty good fit, in my opinion, for this character. Oh, and do make sure you at least put speed boots on him, like some amount of speed, right? Because if he doesn't take a turn, he can't inflict death sentence, and that's kind of the whole point of the character. So if you try to play him at 115 base speed, uh, he's not going to do a whole hell of a lot. At that point, you're better off just playing a character like Dizzy. And to round out the video, let's talk about the aforementioned artifact that you get for free, the Staff of Ein's Ulgon. It increases the effectiveness of Ein's by 20% and the effect resistance by 40%. The caster's effect resistance decreases by 4% with each attack suffered, down to 20%. This artifact seal can only apply to one hero on the team. Uh, I'll be honest with you, for what is considered a world item, I'm not super big on this one. It makes sense when you think about it on paper why this would be the free artifact and why it does what it does. Effectivist helps increase our rate of stuns, helps us land the silence and the death sentence debuff, so obviously no complaints there. And the effect resistance also seems like it would help. This character has similar play styles to characters like Dark Corvus and Arya. In fact, he has the same stat line as Arya, and Arya really wants effect resistance to slow down and control the game. So it makes a lot of sense why they would want you to have effect resistance on this character. The problem is that a character like Dark Corvus, that's pretty much immune to stun, which is the only thing we actually care about. And as long as I get Death Sentence off in a timely fashion, I don't think I really care if I get stunned after that on the character. Like, Arya, if she gets debuffed once, the character's toast. But Ainz, after he uses the goal of all life is death, I don't care if he really gets stunned. So in my opinion, I would just play Abyssal Crown. It just maximizes our chances of landing a stun on Lightning of Judgment. Right? Every time you counter, you get two chances to stun. That's amazing. You have twice the chance. Like, why, why would I not play that? Abyssal Crown at one point was one of the most debilitating and best artifacts in all of Epic 7. It's not seen as much anymore, but for a character who is trying to facilitate a stall and stun-based strategy, it just makes the most sense. Other than that, if you don't have Abyssal Crown, I think Proof of Valor, which is a free artifact that every player has access to as long as they're in a guild, uh, is another great choice because it mitigates the downside of his passive Overlord of Death. It just gives you a bunch of damage reduction, which helps him live longer in order to basically guarantee that we get the Death Sentence. So that's going to wrap it up for my first impressions of Ein's Ul Gon, but let me know how you feel about the character in the comments below. And make sure that you check out the accompanying videos for my first impressions for Albedo and Shaltier, which again are linked down in this video's description. If you enjoyed the video, as always, please leave a like or subscribe to the channel. It costs you nothing, and it's pretty much the nicest thing that you could do for a content creator. If you want to see me play these characters live when they come out next week, you could do so by following me at twitch.tv forward slash I am underscore TSU. Hopefully I'll see you there, and hopefully you enjoy the rest of your day, the rest of your week, and I'll catch you in the next one. Later now.